Welcome to South Asian Environment Dialogue. Uh, this is a program where we discuss the range of issues on environment and climate change, not only in South Asia, but globally, but with a scan and with a close watch on South Asia. Uh, today, we are going to have our 27th episode. For the last six months or all, we are working on this. And thanks to all of you that uh, without this, we can't have this in the first place. Now, this program is brought on by the Climate Channel Canada in collaboration with the Plurals uh, India media platform and also by the No Bangla, uh, No TV Bangla YouTube channel. So today, I think we are going to discuss something which is not only a South Asian issue, it's a global issue, but definitely impacting South Asia because South Asia is one of the uh, more impacted parts of the world in terms of climate change. Our title today, as we have framed it, US Net Zero Summit Show Up or Show Stopper with a question mark. That question mark is very important. And uh, I let me first introduce the panel, a very, very eminent panel. I actually need not uh, introduce them because all of them are known in their own way, but still I have to. I have with me uh, Sanjay Bashish, Director, Climate Action Network South Asia. Welcome Sanjay to the show. Thank you, thanks. Um, yeah. Uh, I have with me Dr. Salim ul a climate scientist, director of International Center for Climate Change and Development, ICAD, and also advisor of the least developed countries and, and whatnot. He's a very, very prominent figure in the global uh, kind of negotiation part. Welcome, Salim ul to the program. Thank you very much, Jayanta. I'm very happy to be here. Great. Absolute pleasure to have you. I have me with me Chandra Vision. Chandra is one of the foremost environmentalist and climate change expert uh, in the country, in India, uh, president of iForest, a nonprofit. Welcome, Chandra. Welcome, CB, to the show, as, I, as we call thank all of, you, all of us you. call CB. So welcome, CB, to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. And we have with me uh, Ranga Pallawala. Ranga, we had the privilege of having you in the program earlier as well. National Climate Finance Advisor for Commonwealth Secretariat from Sri Lanka and uh, really looking forward to have Sri Lanka's point of view from you, Ranga. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, Great. Uh, so with just a short introduction, we all know that uh, Joe Biden, uh, the US president, when he had his campaign, US presidential campaign, uh, in contrary, in sharp contradiction to uh, Donald Trump, the former president, had put climate change action in kind of central to his campaign process. And true to his words, uh, uh, after assuming office within 100 days, he has called for a global meeting, a leader summit, as he called it, uh, to push climate action. And now many are saying that it's a summit to push the net zero target. Uh, now, that's that's great. And I think uh, all, all, all of us have been welcoming it. But also there is a question that uh, how much is actually real action and how much it is actually a geopolitical ploy. Because uh, we all know that due to Donald Trump, he was uh, is kind of out of the main negotiation for four years. And now uh, China almost kind of a prominent position, despite being the biggest emitter of the world. So is Biden actually trying to regain the uh, geopolitical dominance in climate negotiation? Or is something else? So. We will be discussing all this, but let's start. Let's start with that point, and let me start with uh, Dr. Salim Munhak. Dr. Uh, what do you think about it? How you how you qualify this summit? Well, I am uh, quite willing to give uh, President Biden the benefit of the doubt. Okay. Uh, he claims that he wants to become a leader. He he has appointed a number of very senior uh, figures, both in his cabinet as well as the climate envoy, the former. Secretary of State John Kerry, who negotiated the Paris Agreement on behalf of uh, President uh, Obama at that time. Uh, in fact, uh, he sent uh, his climate envoy John Kerry to India and Bangladesh just a few days ago to personally invite your prime minister and my prime minister to join his leaders summit on the 22nd of April. So I take these all as good signs. Um, I take it as a good sign that he has put in place a $2 trillion infrastructure bill, which has very, very significant amounts of investments in the kind of green jobs and kind of uh, uh, changing the 
a trajectory of, of greenhouse gas emissions that needs to be done. So I am quite willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, but then actions speak louder than words. So words are good, but we need the actions to follow. If I can say something about the issue of net zero as well, uh, the issue of net zero actually arises from the agreement in the Paris uh, Agreement of keeping the global temperature below uh, two degrees, well below two degrees, and if possible, below 1.5 degrees. And that is really the goal from particularly the vulnerable countries, but all countries have agreed to do that. And we are not headed in that direction. And so the, the idea of net zero by 2050 or by 2040 or by 2060 is a simple way of telling the world from each country that they are going to take it seriously. They will go to net zero by a, a timeline, a suitable time within that period. These are not plans. These are more like aspirational pledges. There's a long time between now and 2050, all right? So um, we should not go too hung up on whether it's 2050 or 2060 or 2040. In fact, what is more important is what is the 2030 goal? Are you Absolutely. going to- I'll be coming to that. That's a very okay, important good. point you have okay. already raised. We'll discuss that later. I would have come on that because <laughs> okay. 2050 is too, too far away for Fair kind enough. of actually looking at the action. But let's first discuss this geopolitical part. Sanjay, what's your take on that? Well, um, I would agree with the uh, benefit of doubt uh, that Salim has already shared. Yes, US is trying so to- So you're not playing the third umpire role as of now? No. Uh, I'm not <laughs> the third empire. No third empire here. Okay, <laughs> no third empire. I think, uh, you, I mean, it, it, let's welcome uh, Biden's uh, effort. Uh, but then I would also look uh, at, as Salim said, action compared to words, because uh, we have seen in the past, US has not, uh, you are, I mean, taking the uh, efforts in the form of a leadership, we've seen they have really bring, bring down the uh, uh, climate talks um, in terms of agreement, they have also not committed their fair share on the table uh, because I, U.S. can says and um, you know can's position is that uh, if Joe Biden wants to show leadership, leader is always ahead of uh, followers. In that case, 195% by 2030 needs to be reduced compared to 2005 level by uh, U.S. Uh, is uh, Joe Biden uh, willing to commit that? I think that's that would be one action that we can look at. Two trillion is one action. US is also known to bring in private uh, uh, sector, big way. Um, so that's the, I will certainly share my views about, or my apprehensions about that in the net zero discussion. Okay, uh, so so uh, benefit of doubt as of now, but we'll be kind of probing further on that point, but let's first hear CB's view on that. CB, what's your take on that? Benefit of doubt? Well, I, I am, this is not about giving benefit of doubt. I think we have to be realist uh, in climate negotiations. I think for a long time, we have been more ideologues than realist. And that has been a fundamental problem of climate change negotiations. You know, uh, I, you know the Deng Xiaoping famous quote that it doesn't matter whether you have a black cat or a white cat till it catches mice, right? I think climate negotiations needs that attitude. And I think that Joe Biden, at Joe Biden's administration looks like a climate evangelist. Okay. So, and, and this you can feel in first three months uh, in terms of the kind of people who has put into or the kind of announcement he is doing. So I think, first of all, we need to appreciate what dramatic changes have taken place in the US. Absolutely. The four years of Donald Trump administration meant that, you know, frankly, nothing happened internationally. You know, you started by saying that China has taken a leadership role. I'm afraid to say no. Okay, four years of Donald Trump during that period, China never held a global meeting on climate change. Okay, or invited global leaders to pledge something on climate change. So, unfortunately, the reality of the world is whether we like it or not like it. U.S. is still a significant leader. I, I, let me say that a preeminent leader on driving international issues. China, despite it, its economic prowess, hasn't reached that level of getting the entire world behind it uh, to, to move the agenda. Neither okay. Europe has... That uh, that's that. I mean, a very, very important and interesting point, is that you are saying that China doesn't have the 
all of us to make uh, to go with that this yes and neither europe has nor india has you can see what has happened in the four years of us backing so out of need the need us to kind of to in the mainstream of that is the reality clear, that is the reality role. of global climate change agreement global climate change uh, negotiations that us is the preeminent player right now but but do you feel but do you feel cv that uh, us has really played the leadership role it was think about kyoto or copenhagen or whatever no has it played think, a role uh, you i i think us has played constructive role partly and destructive role partly okay i don't think us there is only one way to like like anything things are not black and white okay sure. depending on whether us fundamental problem is this political establishment swings north and south immediately if you have republican uh, it 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 damages everything and in and if you have a, a democratic government then things moves in in, in different right. direction so but overall i think the reality of climate change is that there is no one who can bring everyone on the table to to take the agenda forward that's that's extremely interesting uh, i think it's a kind of a, a rubble rouser so i'll be coming back to all of you but before that to ranga ranga just taking this kind of discussion forward to what uh, uh, salim musab sanjay and cb have been talking about how you qualify this summit and also i really would like to in this geopolitical angle this this a fact that us has only invited leaders of 40 countries and not others in the in the overall 200 or or close to 200 even of triple c members so there has been a bit of a burn on that so and your country is actually not being invited despite being one of the most vulnerable country to climate change how do you take on that ranga yeah i think before i go uh, to an answer that i i would like to highlight one fact uh, uh, when uh, president donald trump announces that he going to withdraw from the paris agreement everybody uh, had a kind of a sense that okay we are going in the same flight of the kyoto protocol but what we have seen is that uh, the the momentum of uh, the climate action could not be reverted even though the us you know moved out of uh, the paris agreement so it mentioned even even within us we have seen uh the sub national government the private sector they were keep on pledging that they will stick on the the paris agreement targets and the paris agreement process so i it's a, it's a it's a kind of a very positive sign for the entire world even though uh us is one of the uh, the largest emitters in, in the global scenario even they uh, take a step back still the momentum is so i think the the doban summit adds value to uh to to the process i think we need to give credit to that it's it's good that us uh, at the national level coming back to the international uh the climate negotiations so whether it's as a political motive whether there's a kind of a hidden agenda that's fine it's it gives a, a positive momentum to the whole process so let's look at look at in, in that angle the, the other question is, is about um inviting uh, only a selected uh, countries to to i i still believe well well there might be might be a reason so so they they have invited mainly the 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 highest uh, the the emitting countries plus the uh, the leaders of the, the negotiating bloc so there there is a kind of a, uh, a logic behind the invitation but i i still take it as a as a positive stance well well we we are, we are rallying around around people rather than looking at the loop for let's look at the positive side it seems the 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 largest emitter coming together along with the other leaders of the block trying to understand how to reach the uh, the the target of net zero by the by the mid century or uh, preferably before that so i think that's that's a positive side sri lanka uh, being being a very vulnerable country uh, with with a very negligible amount of emissions in, in the global scenario i think it could have been nice if, if sri lanka being there but but still i think it's a, it's a, it's a positive move for for countries like sri lanka to see the, the global leaders are rallying around the net zero targets and even without a, without a less uh, emission state so it's a kind of an exemplary uh, move for sri lankan leaders sri lankan policy makers all to make a positive stance and any any any, any, remember, any kind of official comment from the sri lankan government or uh, any response on that front that they are not being invited 
very very recently our uh, ministry of uh, energy uh, came forward with a statement that sri lanka is envisioning to be net zero by 2050 so uh, so that's a statement it's, i i don't think we have an official statement from the head of the government so far but i think we are moving towards that side i'm, I'm okay. optimistic okay great uh, fascinating let's let's come to uh, sanimul sir uh, just taking this uh, Thing forward of selectively kind of inviting people. And uh, though th there is a logic, as Ranga was also pointing out, that maybe the G20 countries and also the head of the blocks being called. But uh, to many people, it's a, it's a contradiction. Because when you are asking individual country to talk about their climate action, how can you take one country from a block to talk about all of them? It's virtually difficult. India can't talk about China. India can't talk about uh, the other countries in the basic. So that's one point. And it's on Zoom. It's a virtual one. So I'm sure that if we have in Zoom here can have 100 people, uh, surely Joe Biden could have 200 people. So uh, what's your take on that? Because also people think thinking that Joe Biden coming and taking such a uh, welcome position uh, on, on climate change and climate action after the Donald Trump era, uh, it would have been a good initiation if you would have called all of them. It could have been a more comfortable, cushioned kind of thing. And as uh, CB pointing out, that to take the true leader's, leader's position. What's your take on that, Salvusa? Well, uh, you need to remember that this meeting on the 22nd of April, which is Earth Day, celebrated in the United States of America, not in the rest of the world, but in the United States, they, they celebrate Earth Day on the 22nd of April. The rest of the world, we do World Environment Day on the 6th of June. Um, it is not the first time the Americans have done this, okay? So this, this meeting on Earth Day has a history. It was started by President Bush, where he invited 20, only 20 of the major emitters to a meeting. And it was originally called a major emitters meeting, then they changed the name to major economies meeting. Uh, and the premise was, that if you get the 20 biggest emitters around the table and they agree to reduce their emissions, then the job is more okay. or less done. Yeah. The rest of the countries don't matter. As Ranga just said, my emissions in Bangladesh, his emissions in Sri Lanka, they don't count. If we go to zero, it makes no difference. India, China, and, and uh, the US and the big economies count. Now, what Biden has done, he's ad added another 20 countries to that big emitters list of 20. Uh, and uh, in that next, a layer of 20 countries, they have identified, as Ranga has quite rightly said, some leaders' roles from the vulnerable countries in particular. And Bangladesh has been selected in that capacity. My Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina is now the, currently the leader of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, Sir. which is 48 of the most vulnerable countries. Okay, so she has a leadership position there and she's being invited in that capacity. And by the way, the Climate Vulnerable Forum long ago in uh, COP22 in Marrakesh had declared an intention to go to 100% renewable by 2050 before any other country in the world. And so, you know, the Vol Climate Vulnerable Forum countries have been making this commitment for a long time already. So um, I, I don't think that it needs every single country uh, to be invited to give a speech. It's important that they all give their views on what needs to be, uh, what needs to happen. But as far as emission reduction and reaching the global uh, temperature goal, then major emitters are the ones that matter. And their emissions are what matters, not 200 countries, not 40 200 countries. countries. Okay. Uh, Sanjay, just to take it forward, I was kind of reminding of, though it's a bit of a distant and maybe, maybe you may say that it was a stretched way of imagination. I was thinking about that night in Copenhagen when the uh, U.S. kind of brought a group of countries and tried to bulldoze their decision on the rest of the world. And yeah. we all saw on that evening, I was there actually sitting in the, I, I didn't go back to the hotel. I was, I thought in my mind, something historical is going to happen in front of me. So I was struck out there. So my, my question is that uh, we saw also what happened in Copenhagen, uh, it, how it fall flat. More important than how it actually pushed back the global negotiation to a number of years. So what do you think about it? Wouldn't it be... Yeah kind of nicer if the U.S. could have called all of them or making a kind of a, some, some kind of a inclusion procedure. 
I'm not saying requesting all leaders to be part of it, but some kind of an inclusion procedure. What's your thought? Okay. Well, if I recall um, uh, right, then I think we all were uh, in Copenhagen uh, that <laughs> night um, and uh, very de uh, depressed uh, with the outcome. Um, well, my view is, and actually, uh, uh, thanks, uh, Jenta, for asking this question, because uh, we saw uh, the, uh, you know, the in criteria that U.S. used to bring countries forward. I think they have used this criteria once again, this time where almost 80% of global emissions are by these 17 to 20 countries. And even they, they also uh, contribute almost 80% of GDP. Um, so keeping that in mind, uh, you know, if US has been able to, in Copenhagen, they, uh, Obama administration only bought those 20 countries. Uh, now they are more sensitive. They have learned their lesson. They, are, they have also, they also realized that it's not only these two, uh, 20 countries, it's also other countries who all uh, play an important role. My opinion about so, uh, only 40 countries uh, and not all is uh, maybe you know uh, you know to infuse some confidence that we have to collectively decide and support the UNFCC process which is, a, which is a legitimate process rather than creating an alternative space for negotiation that would be dangerous uh, that that would again set back the climate talks so certainly uh, the main process of climate talks where decisions are being taken by global county is UNFCCC and these kind of bilateral summits or multilateral with 40 countries should add uh, to the momentum rather than challenge the authority. So that's what I, I strongly think. That, and and, and, and do, don't feel that it's kind of trying to create a kind of a parallel to you know, triple C yes, movement. Absolutely. Because we, we were leading that. the show and the major economies out there. It can always be taken as a kind of a bit of a parallel to that. Yeah. So, and if you remember, Agenda in Copenhagen, uh, the Copenhagen uh, COP collapsed because of that, because Absolutely. voting capacity of other countries was undermined by this 20 countries process. And that should not be done. In fact, in fact, let me publicly say here, I, I had the chance of talking to uh, uh, Daj Gupta, uh, who was kind of China's envoy and part of that uh, negotiation in, in Kolkata, some time back, and he said that how Barack Obama, American president at that point of time, came into the room and just knocked him because he was sitting, Chandrasekhar Dajgupta was sitting in India's uh, negotiation chair, and he just came and just gave a tap and said, when he turned back, he saw that Obama was there. He said, guys, we have to do something about it. We have to find a solution. So, so that's the kind of uh, thing you has always pushed. So that's, that's the, yes, definitely, uh, it's a very great move of Joe Biden, but these questions will be there. Great. Let let go to let go to CB. CB uh, kind of deflecting from this question a bit. Let's talk about the India's position. Uh, John Kerry came to India, also to Bangladesh and uh, Bhutan, and uh, apparently there was no news in the mainstream media. No press releases. Nothing. I actually did a story. Depending on seven tweets, I had to dig out tweets, and best of the tweets, I did a story. And my story's main point was that, that India is not willing to shift this goalpost right now. India very clearly saying we'll be, we are sticking to the Paris commitment and we'll be doing that. Nothing more at this point of time. And subsequently, it was substantiated because the basic country meeting, there was a basic country meeting immediately after John Kerry came to India. And there, a formal uh, kind, of, uh, kind of a notice where this same thing was reiterated. And then, uh, you know that Indian environment minister had a press conference and saying the same thing. So what's your take on that? Uh, uh, that uh, this is a push and counter push between India and US, what do you feel about? So what you see is the reiteration of India's position for a long time, but I will say you will be in for surprise on 22nd of April, okay? Uh, you know, what you heard from people, uh, you know, who have repeated the same ins you know, same issues uh, over a long period of time, whether Mr. Javadekar, who has been environment minister for a long time, or the bureaucracy, or in the civil society, people who very strongly believe that what has happened in the past 30 years in terms of principle should continue for the next 30 years. I don't fall in that group now, okay? I very strongly believe that what has failed for the past 30 years cannot succeed for the next 30 years. Okay, it's very clear. 
there is no no you know you use any benchmark to judge what has happened for the past 30 years in unf triple c and if you can say that something has worked then i can you know i can support the idea that let's continue with this i'm also responding exactly. to sanjay's issues of keeping the negotiation at unf triple c why okay just because we have done for 30 years at unf triple c does it mean that we should not look at other avenues okay there are so many multilateral uh, platforms to discuss this unf triple c cannot solve world's problem okay at multiple platforms if you really want to reach net zero if you are really looking at 1.5 why should we stuck at one platform what is the argument other than the fact that we have negotiated for 30 years at unf triple c okay there are multiple i i strongly believe multilateralism should be the should be the fulcrum of climate action but that multilateralism can happen at tens of platform that exist okay we, we can create multiple multilateral regional platform to address climate change so i am not stuck with unf triple c unf triple c processes are also toxic okay if anyone says that it's a very camaraderie uh, that that is exhibited at unf triple c is wrong that's a toxic process we we all have contributed to that so i i am coming back jayanto with a very clear perspective now that in climate negotiations you don't have to be sanctimonious okay we have been sanctimonious for for years now now look at practical answers which is going to solve your problem in case of india we have air pollution we have water pollution we have ghg emission we have we have we have degrade degradation of forest and land and many of them will have co benefit of climate change mm -hmm. okay now to say that that you know what i'm i'm not going to do anything if someone else doesn't do how does it help us okay so uh, uh, india i believe it is in india's interest that the, there is a global action on 1.5 it is in bangladesh interest that there is a global action on 1.5 okay we can either be bystanders or we can be the leaders okay the choice is ours okay and i believe that it is in india's interest to lead this argument and i'll come back to it there is need to frame net zero okay frame net zero in a way that it is useful for everyone so so you feel that india should frame its net zero target and of go course. by it that. is part of paris agreement salim said that net zero has not dropped Absolutely. from from some tree it is part of paris agreement every country has to give a decarbonization strategy by mid but what they are going to do in in the middle of the next century you know net zero in fact i just want to tell you because media is portraying as if net zero is something new no net zero is new for us because we have not discussed it but net zero is part of the paris agreement we have signed on to it absolutely okay you can't be we we generally accuse developed countries by saying they are selective but so are we okay we you know so i think you know there is need for a little bit of honesty in the discussion on climate change in india okay. okay i feel we have lost that that ability to be honest for a long time it is important that we bring it back but see very quickly uh, that what's your take on this push and counter push between us and india uh, john kerry coming and kind of uh, pushing india to to commit something either in the summit this particular summit or in glasgow and india countered by officially saying now that we are sticking and you know in madrid the indian uh, negotiator very clearly said if we are not inclined to accept preponing the gst even they were not willing to take global stock take preponing the global stock take sanjay knows it because we discussed there so very quickly your take on that on india's position I don't have to respond to John Kerry. Why Good should response. we respond to Jan, John Kerry? We should come out with our own agenda. What we want to do. Why should I respond to anyone? We are, we are, you know, we are making is as if John Kerry is U.S. is pushing us. Okay. Why should why should anyone push us? Okay. 
We are a proud nation, a big economy of 1.3 billion people with lots of problems. Okay. Okay. We don't. Okay. No one needs to set agenda for us. Okay. We need okay. to set agenda for ourselves. Got the point. Yeah. Got the point. Right yes, now, very interesting. It, you you, you hard India's I position, and I'll be coming to Sanjay to talk about India's position as well. But before that, to Sri Lanka's position uh, is that see the kind of a target like a net zero. I think is not relevant. In India's case, it is realistic or not. In your case, it is relevant or not. So, what's your take on this kind of target being set? How do you see that? And uh, what's the Sri Lanka's official position on that as well? Chandra, I will build on what Chandra just. Uh, mentioned short while back. We have our own set of problems. And uh, all these problems have uh, direct or indirect links to, to climate change. So as a country, we need to set our own targets and our own pathways. So uh, if we are, if now we are, we are talking about uh, the less emitting countries might have uh, less relevance towards uh, net zero targets. But I, I think it's not. I think it's not. If, if Chandra correctly mentioned that the, the climate change negotiations is not just one track. It's going, it's coming with, with different pathways. Different things are, are convergent. I'll take an example. The recent EU Green Deal. If you take the, uh, the recent EU Green Deal, now they're talking about putting a price on carbon and even coming up with uh, border carbon adjustment mechanism uh, on selected goods and services reaching to their border based on the, the emissions of, of the country. So I think uh, the countries like Sri Lanka, countries who are, who, are, who are not emitting so much, but they are connected to the world through the global trade and so many other pathways as well. I took trade as only, only one aspect. So if those countries are not rallying around this idea of net zero, they need to digest this. If you are not going ahead uh, with our own pathways, what will happen is that equitable transition towards net zero in the, in the global scenario that, that most of the countries will fall behind. We might have a lot of trade implications and economic implications if the countries with less emissions are not going ahead with, with the targets. As Chandra correctly mentioned, we have agreed. Every country has agreed that we will go for net zero by, by, by mid-century. So, so the countries need to have it. So irrespective of your, your, your uh, emission level, I think as, as a climate change, uh, the people who are, who are advocating for, for climate action, I think we need to push each and every country to have their own net zero target. Okay. Ranga, I, I, I think that even Sri Lanka, uh, though yet to announce officially, is now working towards a net zero target. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure about the, the Sri Lanka's position, but, I, but I, I, it's highly likely that that, that position, position will, will go through. Uh, but of course, there are there are so many other things might might also consider, especially about the uh, the, the post COVID recession and, and stuff as well. But but I think uh, the net net zero will will coming up because I have seen the the lot of discussions are going on in terms of the trade aspects. Uh, from the private sector and even from the small and medium sector enterprises that if we are not moving towards that, uh, we will be very incompetitive in the, in the international markets and so, so as in the other processes as well. Okay. Great. Uh, uh, Salim Saab, uh, I think, uh, first of all, uh, uh, Bangladesh position on that, the same thing that I think the net zero doesn't kind of relevant in case of Bangladesh. And also, I, I really would like to kind of add on. Uh, I was looking at an action aid report uh, uh, some time back, which clearly shows that net zero is not the real zero. And also talking about that uh, to do the net zero, the amount of plantation and other things you need to do, do have the land. So there are a lot of other factors. Just jumping on the net zero won't work. You have to also see the how the whole package goes. So what's your take on that? Uh, thank you very much, Jayant. I'll answer your question in a minute, but I do want to pick up on uh, the uh, discussion between Sanjay and CB. Uh, 
okay. and give you my view on on the COP and the UNFCC process. Absolutely. As as one of the very few people who have been to every single one of the 25 COPs under the UNFCC, um, I used to believe a lot in the COPs, but I am now inclined to agree with CB. Uh, it is it's lost its uh, ability and purpose. And I'll give you an example. The example is the fact that because of COVID-19, COP26 had to be postponed from November 2020 to now November 2021. And they're even discussing maybe another postponement because we all won't be able to go to Glasgow uh, for it if it, you know, in the old way. And so in this one year of postponement, climate change has not stopped. In fact, I would say climate change has crossed a threshold where we are now visibly in a climate changed world. The global temperature has gone up above one degree. We are seeing impacts. Just uh, uh, in May of last year, India and Bangladesh got hit by a super cyclone, Amphan. That became a super cyclone because the temperature in the Bay of Bengal was two degrees above normal. That is climate change. It's happening. We are suffering loss and damage from climate change. Postponing a COP is not going going to postpone climate change. And so I am now inclined to agree with CB that we don't need these big meetings to agree on things. We've agreed already. We've agreed the Paris Agreement. We need to implement them. Let two countries come together, Japan and US just, you know, the, the two leaders just met. Let them agree to implement it. Let India talk to Bangladesh and say to us, two countries will implement it. Everybody needs to be talking about implementation every single day, not just for two weeks out of 52 weeks in the year. Okay, so to me, the COP is now almost redundant if we cannot keep the momentum going in, the, in getting things done implementing them. So let me answer your question on net zero in the case of Bangladesh. Uh, it doesn't Sarusa, matter. Before you answer that, yep. I just have a quick supplementary question on that. The COP has redundant, become a kind of redundant because of its structure or because of the minds of the countries. The countries, I, my experience is they're always pulling it back. So even if we turn from the multilateralism to kind of a bilateral and implementation we're talking about, the same people with the same mindset will operate. So unless the mindset of the country and their leaders change, whether we have a COP or we have something else is going to be the same thing, isn't it? You're quite right. I mean, you know, as Chandra very right, uh, correctly said, nothing is black and white. You know, there are good things in the COP, there are bad things in the COP. But I'm what I'm arguing is that the bad is now outweighing the good. Ah. Okay. And so, you know, where there were good things. We had Kyoto, we had uh, Paris, but Paris to me was the pinnacle. We got an agreement, okay? COP26, Glasgow is not going to be a new agreement. It's just giving momentum to the agreement we did six years ago, okay? And we, for six years, we haven't done anything. So we need to be pushing action, not just meeting to talk about Absolutely. doing action. That meeting to talk is no longer a relevant uh, 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 reason for 200 countries to come together. There are some good things that happen there. We all get to go there. We all get to meet each other. These are benefits. I, I enjoy that. <laughs> One of the benefits of being there, but it's not essential. You know, we can find other ways to meet. But can I answer the question on Bangladesh? Uh, sure, sure, I sure. I'll come to Sanjay to respond okay. to your point later. Uh, sure, but first, sure. Bangladesh. So on Bangladesh, uh, the, uh, again, I, I agree with CB. It is a national issue. Okay, it is our responsibility to do the right thing for our own country. And as I said, collectively, the Climate Vulnerable Forum countries had already, long time ago, said 100% renewable energy. This is a goal by 2050 that they had set as a, a sort of a, a aspirational goal. In the case of Bangladesh, we are now looking at that very, very seriously. And we are preparing something called the Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan. And to answer your question on the limits of solar energy uh, because of the uh, lack of land, we are looking at the Bay of Bengal for wind energy and the possibilities of wind energy in the Bay of Bengal for both Bangladesh and, uh, and India are phenomenal, phenomenal. If we can harness wind energy, which the new technology of wind turbines allows us to do in the next 10 years, then we will satisfy the needs of West Bengal and Bangladesh from wind energy in the Bay of Bengal. And that's something we are now looking at. So we need to look at what's best for us, not necessarily what's best for the world. And then if we can do something which is good for us and for the world, we will 
announce it. We will pronounce it. We will publicize it. But the reason we do it is because it's good for ourselves. So the reason should not be we're doing it for somebody else. So, I'll so you feel that you feel that this net zero is kind of a uh, uh, achievable target? Absolutely, I mean, it it'll be achieved. I, I have no doubt about it. But but do you think? Don't you think that? Uh, say India is talking about 2050, 2060, 2070, but don't we need smaller targets? Let me let me tell you why I'm confident about meeting net zero sooner rather than later. The answer is that if you look at the fossil fuel economy, coal, petroleum, and natural gas versus the renewable energy economy, wind, solar, and batteries, okay? There's a three legs. Wind and solar are both intermittent, so you need batteries to give you a stable supply. The cost of wind and solar and batteries is going down like that. Every day it's going down. Saudi Arabia just had the yes. lowest solar energy production in the whole world just yesterday. And tomorrow they'll be even lower. And day after tomorrow, even lower. On the other hand, coal is becoming more expensive. Petroleum is becoming more expensive. Even natural gas is becoming more expensive. So just on, just on cost market. benefit market, exactly, the investors, they're not going to invest in fossil anymore. They're going to invest in where they're going to make money and they're going to make money in renewables. And if incidentally, Joe Biden's uh, infrastructure plan is about green jobs. He's selling it for green jobs that it's going to create, not for climate. Fact, Joe Biden actually has been pushing it. He doesn't mention climate. He says green jobs. Okay, Joe Biden has been pushing it. Mm -hmm. Precisely. And I think it's the right strategy right, because that's where the future lies. And and we once that's we start important. moving in that direction, we'll find that it's much easier to mm -hmm. move than we mm -hmm. thought before. We thought it was hard, very difficult. Once we start moving, we'll say it's not that difficult. We can do it. We can do that. So uh, yeah, uh, just to take forward the discussion that we have, very fascinating. Uh, also, the relevance of COP has been come under scanner. Not only during this discussion, but I have seen various experts are talking about it, whether we do need a such a huge kind of a on your face COP program or do you need smaller ones? But COP also has its own advantages. Once you do something in COP, that being accepted all across the world. So what's your take on that? Do we need COP like a cricket that we have to reinvent 50 overs cricket, T20 cricket, just to save cricket? Do you need a kind of a kind of a restructuring of COP, something of that sort? Uh, Sanjay, what do you feel about it? Jayanta, very good analogy. Um, I think uh, me and uh, CV has been discussing it for last, you know, so many years about relevance of uh, UNFCCC process and all that. Well, I have a different opinion about it. Um, if I look at, you know, uh, last so many years of UNFCCC process and uh, how uh, at the national level in many countries, climate policies have emerged, that's the outcome of UNFCCC. You know, whenever we speak about uh, adaptation or resilience, we normally speak about right kind of development that will bring in the co-benefit. Similarly, UNFCC process has brought in a co-benefit. And co-benefit has been that India has national action plan on climate change, state action plan on climate change. We have missions. Unfortunately, our bureaucracy has been more reactive than proactive. Had they been more proactive, I think we didn't need UNFCC. What other thing that UNFCCC has bought in, of course, not to a great deal, I'm not happy with it, is argument about equity and climate justice. And the fact that every country is involved in climate, global climate policy making. It's not 20 countries or, uh, and I don't think, uh, you know, Joe Biden or uh, China would like to have a bilateral with, let's say, uh, Papua New Guinea to talk about climate change. Those talks are more about, uh, you know, as uh, uh, Salim mentioned about green jobs. I mean, basically the economy, trade, uh, mm -hmm. how they can, uh, uh, both countries can be, can benefit with it. They are not about global commons and UNFCC process has been talking about global commons. Having said that, I do agree that whatever, now countries have learned how to maneuver around COP and not to do anything. So we have to certainly change the architecture. <laughs> But UNFCC has to be the space for climate uh, talks to take to pursue climate agenda. Salim, you mentioned about that last two years climate change has not uh, stopped. I agree with you. But I think there has been a huge dent on climate solutions agenda. How much has been able to, you know, every, there's no burden on countries to report back every six months 
what did you do in in last six months? I think that burden has certainly well. They can say we are a sovereign country, we are uh, a, 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 you know proud country. We can uh, handle our problems, but I think uh, let's agree that every six months countries come forward and try to bring some. new and that's the that has driven the climate agenda forward so that's my opinion uh, on the UNFCCC. okay let, let, let's let's take this opportunity to probe further uh, don't you think if, if we take yes even if triple c has its own importance whether it has become redundant or still a relevant force that's something to kind of discuss and deliberate uh, i think in a much more details manner but let's see if we if we all accept that uh, the UNF C's movement has been rather slow. Let's put it, even if we put it kind of a uh, yeah. dialogue, this is rather slow. And we have all seen that how the first seven days, nothing works by the bureaucrats. And the last last seven days, last couple of days, uh, everybody jumping to it and extending yeah. it for 30 hours, 40 hours to get a yeah. solution. I never understood when you have yeah. 14 days, how... Why can't we have your ministers before and actually yeah. do the solution for rather than bringing them the last two three days? We need to. Having said that, agree. having said that, uh, don't you think if we say uh, an improved version of the UNFCCC movement, the more involvement of the civil society and the academician and the experts in a formal manner? Yeah. I'm not saying of the informal manner that's happening. That yeah. you are part of an observation meet, observer meeting or something. Not really that. A real voice and legal authorized voice in the negotiation. Do you think, does it improve the situation? That, so as I said, UNFCC process certainly needs reforms. I'm not saying that we should not. We don't need two weeks cops or substars. No. I think as you said, uh, uh, using analogy of cricket, yes, we need a shorter duration, but enough political pressure that you have to deliver in this rather than waste 10 days and then only, uh, you know, uh, wake up in last four, four days or five days. So certainly, you know, uh, we need reforms. So there is, so one is UNFCC process, other is COP as part of the process. UNFCC process, certainly we need it. It is doing great work. It has pursued agenda to this extent. The fact that 2015, we all clapped for Paris Agreement. We, are, we feel proud to achieve Paris Agreement today. That's all delivered by COPs as well as UNFCC process. But now, from now till 2030, I don't think uh, you know, we need two weeks of COPs. 2030, maybe next uh, climate deal, Few years before that, maybe two weeks of COPs will be required to uh, give enough negotiation time. Certainly, you know, uh, we need th those kind of reforms. One needs to think about. Uh, I just, I, I can't help but asking very quickly responses of all of you three. Let's start with Salim. So very quickly, that uh, you see that you think that reforms are required rather than completely kind of uh, cutting it out. What's your take on that? I absolutely agree. Reforms. And let me give you an example of reform. I don't know how much you have followed this, but the United Nations under the Secretary General is also holding a UN Food Systems Summit in uh, later this year, before the COP. And they have adopted, under the Secretary General, a very different modality. It's not a negotiated document between countries, which is what we do in the COPs. They have identified five different action tracks and invited five independent individuals to lead these action tracks. And I have the privilege of leading action track number five, which is on resilience, food system resilience, which includes under climate change. And our mandate is to talk to everybody. We regularly talk to governments. We have to listen to governments, but governments cannot tell us what to do. We also listen to civil society, we listen to farmers, we listen to fishers, to young people, to women, anybody. We're listening all the time. We are taking in ideas all the time. And then we, the five chairs, will put these together and we will put them to the UN Secretary General and say, this is what we think needs okay. to be done. Now you convince the governments to endorse it or approve it. They can or they can't, it's up to them, but it's a new way of working. It's not negotiated text. So that mechanism, the mechanism the needs means, to be... Precisely. It's answering your question of how can other voices play a part in the decision-making. More inclusive. Making exactly. it more inclusive. Precisely. Rather and than trying, through governmental negotiator it. taking the call. Precisely. So that maybe might have improved the so, uh, cop standing of it. I hope so. I hope so. I, I, hope so. I, I, I have you to all deliver. So. <laughs> CB, you are still completely against cop or you, you think cop with modification? Very quickly. You're, you're muted. 
Sibi. Uh, my there are a few points that I want to make here. Okay, I am not saying that get rid of UNFCCC. I am saying there is need for reform at UNFCCC. But I am saying UNFCCC cannot be the only platform for action. Okay, we can create a partnership at UNIDO, for example. I am just giving you some name. You know, we'll have to find an institutional fit. But you can think about an industrial partnership at UNIDO. Where countries can come together and discuss how to decarbonize the steel and cement sector. Okay, for example, countries are already discussing uh, aviation. Okay, uh, at uh, at ICAO, uh, there is discussion on ships at IMO. So what I'm trying to say that in 30 years we have made climate change as a, a sole property of UNFCCC. Okay, the time has come to divest that mm -hmm. that property. Okay, and yeah. think about because you know I always wonder how can you solve a world's problem negotiated by generalists? Mm -hmm. Most of the negotiators have no idea about how economy works. Okay, most of them are diplomats. Okay, how do you solve world problem in fourteen days negotiated by generalists? About a text that countries go back and reject it. This is the history of 30 years of UNFCCC. So we have to find multiple platforms where realistic discussion, debate, and action will, can take place. So I think there is a value for UNFCCC in terms of taking stock, taking uh, in terms of taking stock of what is happening uh, in the world, what action countries are doing to look at. The big picture; those kind of things are fine at UNFCCC, but I don't think UNFCCC is now a, a platform for real action, implementation. That Salim was talking okay. about. We have to find different modalities. The so, second, kind of a reform. Yeah, UNFCCC reform and create multiple platforms to multiple take action, platform. implement. The last point I want to make is, you know, the Westphalian model of sovereignty needs to be seriously discussed. Okay, one of the things that coronavirus has told us is that sovereignty can be used to basically, you know, uh, completely destroy the world. You know, the Chinese response to coronavirus investigation is something that we should carefully watch. Okay, now it is important for the world to know what is the source of this virus, how. To understand its its origin, so that we can find out that it doesn't happen happen again. Okay, but China is using sovereignty, okay, as a tool to basically block this international investigation. Now countries can do this in an interconnected world. We are no more living in 18th century when it took you know 90 days for British ship to start from UK and reach Surat. Okay, it now takes nine hours. For a flight to do, uh, so in an interconnected world, in an interconnected economy, it, you know, I think we need to start discussing the nature of sovereignty in an okay. interconnected world. That discussion is very, very important for global governance. That's another area of discussion. Fine, we have just ten minutes of time with us, but Ramza, uh, very quickly take on this. In what format do you think that even a triple C? Uh, What kind of reform? Very quickly, and also uh, let's also start this expectation part. That uh, what's your expectation from the summit? What do you really expect from the summit? Any concrete expectation you do have uh, as a country of Sri Lanka and in general, uh, Ranga? Yeah, I think uh, if, we, if we talk about uh, the UNEP Triple C process, what what the, there's a missing element in all the time. Missing element is that UNEP Triple C. The process is not the the two weeks or, or five weeks in a year that you do negotiations. There there is a lot more uh, supporting processes need to happen back in the countries, back on the ground, and that analysis come together and, and that should be implemented, right? But what we have seen is is the 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 rest of the 320 days has been forgotten. The only the the 40 days or so that we are we are meeting somewhere. Around the world, everybody coming and, and talking and negotiating has been highlighted, but the the back end processes have been uh, 
neglected or it has not been brought to the limelight. I think that's the missing part. I think that's why why we are talking. It's about that we need the reform. Exactly. It's actually not needing a reform. It's about it's a, of course it's a, it's a reform because we have not been practicing it. What we need to do is that we need to bring it forefront. I think I think we are, we have moved forward because the the, the Paris Agreement, uh, being the national determined contributions as the building block, NDC itself provides a country to think about the the national level homework to be done. So it's about it's about the policy coherence which has been missing in the, in the entire okay. process of history. So the countries are now thinking about the national level policy coherence, bringing exactly. different sectors together, how to articulate and, and coming up with the process. So we need to do that. So we okay. need a change. But expectation change, and, and now the expectation. We are just I don't have to work it out. What's the expectation from the summit, Ranga? The expectation from the summit, of course, we again again the expectation should be in line with Paris Agreement. We, we want to limit the global temperature rise well below two degrees and that preferably 1.5. Okay. So we need to move towards that. Everybody, every country, every leader, every organization need to move towards that. Expectation is that we have some sort of a positively contributing factor within the summit that we are going towards that. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's start with CV. CV, your expectation from the summit? Very quickly. My expectation is that if U.S. has called this meeting, U.S. will also have to announce a significant ambition. Okay, the test of the success of summit will be U.S. leadership. It okay. wants to show leadership. So you expect U.S. to come up with some yes. very concrete. Then, from India's perspective, I think India should also announce a net zero target. I have very clearly said that the net zero has to be developed within a framework where it is self-differentiated, it is flexible. You don't need a hard net zero target. As Salim said, we might achieve it much quicker than, than, than what we are doing. So even if India announces 2060, for example, it should be that- No, are you saying that, are you expecting uh, some target to be set up by India during the summit, this summit? I am saying India should announce a net zero target. You should, okay. Yeah, okay. I'm saying India should announce a net zero target, but India should also clarify what net zero means. Okay. okay? Fine. It should be built on short-term target. NDCs are, are important. So 2030 target is going to be important. So mm -hmm. I don't think there is any problem of announcing a net zero and not announcing uh, an NDC. Understand. So, okay. so India should be flexible about it. India should but, be flexible but the last it. point, The last point I want to make here is the net zero discussion must parallel with a just transition discussion. Mm -hmm. okay. Absolutely. All Very important. countries are Very important to, corollary. Very important are, corollary. are going to have transition issues. So I okay. think both this discussion must happen and so should adaptation. So I, okay. I now see three pillars of just transition, net zero and adaptation Good. as a come, three come legs together. of the stool on which the work should happen. Great. Uh, uh, Salim Saab, what's your take on the expectation? So I, I agree with Chandra on the expectation. If we uh, see the summit as uh, President Biden's efforts to reclaim leadership on climate change, as he has uh, said that he wants to do, uh, then uh, taking action at home on their own targets, essential, uh, fulfilling their obligations for finance uh, on... Uh, uh, is it private finance or public finance? Public finance from the U.S. government. So we expect uh, private, public finance exactly, to be announced. Absolutely. Okay. Um, uh, the good news is, by the way, incidentally, when John Kerry was in Dhaka, he did say that they are going to replenish the, uh, the shortfall that was made in the 2020 target when the U.S. was supposed to pay $3 billion. They only paid $1 billion under Biden, and then Trump stopped the second uh, two. Biden will provide that, and he will also add more for the 2021 target. So that is a promise that uh, they have already publicly made. But I tell you the one thing that is... Uh, to me, it's still a, a niggling problem. And I had the opportunity to meet uh, John Kerry when he was in Dhaka. Our foreign minister invited him to a lunch where I was invited. And I asked him about, what about financing loss and damage? Because while you have been away for the last four years, climate change is happening. It's causing loss and damage. This is not Paris anymore. This is not 2015. This is 2021. And people are losing their lives and their livelihoods and their uh, homes and their places. What are you going to do to help them? And his answer was not very happy. He said, you know, well, we'll fund adaptation and resilience. 
funding oh. and for loss and damage will be difficult. So we have to push. <laughs> so so this question comes back. There was a question mark. But is it is it a ploy to claim leadership or is it? Is, is well, is that's, it my, that's, we, my, perhaps, my, we, that's my that's my that's my test for Donald leadership. Trump exactly. benchmark we, yeah. with the with the perhaps the benchmark of Donald Trump. We are trying to kind of believe everything he's talking about or really hopeful that he will be fill up that. But really, the reality may be different. But anyway, we, we can expect all this that. Uh, Sanjay, your take on the expectation. I would agree with all um, uh, you know, uh, inputs that we have received on expectations. Yes, higher uh, targets by US. One, uh, they cannot claim leadership unless they... So you're expecting the fair this to come up from the US. We are almost the fag end of the program. Let me, let me end with a... a Quick questionnaire, just you have to respond. I'll be giving you three options. That is this is this summit going to be a game changer, changing goalpost, or geopolitics? Maybe a combination of any of two of them or whatever. So let's start with Sanjay. Sanjay, what's your take on that? It's 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 game changer, changing goalpost, or or geopolitics. Sanjay. Geopolitics. Uh, too early to say whether it's a game changer. It's a geopolitics. Salim Saab, yours? I would agree, geopolitics, but in a good way. He wants to become leader of the climate change world. Let him do that. Let him demonstrate it. Okay. Let him demonstrate that he's a leader. Uh, okay. Uh, Ranga, your take? It's, there's a geopolitics uh, element of it, but I think it's, it's also have a, have a game-changing element as well. Um, you know, okay. Compared okay. to the last few years, it's, it's going to change the game. Uh, CV? Yeah, I mean to say I agree that it is it is geopolitics in good way. But one thing I will I'll tell you a quote of Mustafa Tolba. He used to be the head of UNEP, and Tolba always used to say that the global environmental governance is a canter. It is not a gallop. Okay, so uh, this is what we have seen. So I I will I, you know my my sense is that uh, this will set the stage for much much more speed on action uh, that we should see because we there's going to be a series of things uh, before COP26 if it happens. Mm. Uh, but this will be the beginning of my hope of positive development. And, okay. Uh, on okay. So kind of a game changer in that case. Not game is, changer. I, I said it is a canter. It cannot be a gallop. <laughs> it can't be a gallop. Okay. And this initiation of a game changing process, if we put it in that way. I think it's a great, great discussion. And I think we we kind of shifted it from the men's thing and we talked about the UNF Triple C, uh, whether it has really become redundant, really a force to reckon with. Do we need and all of all of the very eminent panelists agreed that we need some kind of a deconstruction? I don't say deconstruction, rethinking about the UNF Triple C process, making it more, 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 more inclusive. It is inclusive in the CV's way of adding more multilateral structures into it or linking to it or uh, the kind of more voices from the academics, from the researchers. But, but at the same time, I think most of you agree that it's more of a geopolitics. And uh, we all hope that these geopolitics will act in a positive manner vis-a-vis uh, -vis the global climate negotiation and will actually contribute to the success of COP26 rather than dragging it back. The only kind of, kind of a concern is that he was creating a parallel platform without linking it properly with the actual platform, actually can play a spoil sport in, 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 in future. So these are all in the expectation, in the thought process. Uh, we all have to kind of look very closely what how it rolls out. So 22nd and 23rd, whether the way we look at it, a game changer or a geopolitics or a shifting goalpost, it is going to be a very, very important summit. And I don't think after Copenhagen, after Paris, we really had that level of summit. I can still remember when we went to Copenhagen to cover, CB was with us. And when we saw CB, you can remember in the Metro Rail, when we were all going, we see Copenhagen. So <laughs> the Copenhagen was transformed to Copenhagen. So again, that hope coming back, and that hope went out with the window in Copenhagen. I can remember that in uh, the next summit in Cancun on the beautiful sea beaches, hope with a question mark came back. So we all expect that hope will be more stronger. And we all expect, uh, because climate change is a real, real problem. Uh, I think Corona is affecting all of us. COVID is affecting all of us. But 
COVID can be a kind of a children play in comparison to climate change when it actually affects you in that level. We all saw what happened in Amphan, we all saw what happened in Nargis, Cedar North. So with that, we keep on watching, we'll keep on talking. Next week, perhaps we'll again talk about it. But for this time, we end here. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice Thank talking you. to everybody. Thank Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.